Welcome to the latest episode of our podcast series for financial advisors. Today's episode is from ex Morgan Stanley advisor to one of the biggest breakaway stories of 2019, a conversation with Jason Fertitta, president and partner of Americana Partners. I'm Mindy Diamond, and this is Mindy Diamond on Independence. This podcast is available on our website, diamond-consultants.com and on advisorhub.com, as well as Apple Podcasts and other major podcast platforms. If you are not already a subscriber and want to be notified of new show releases, please subscribe right on your favorite podcast platform or on the episode page on our website. And if you find the content in this series to be useful and know others who could benefit from it, feel free to share it widely. Many advisors struggle with the idea of independence being a viable option for them, particularly when they have a book of business in which a portion isn't portable or profitable. Then the decision to stay or go rests on the calculus of whether they're willing to leave behind some of their assets for the potential of being able to better serve their core customers and grow their business with greater freedom and flexibility. Essentially, getting smaller to ultimately get bigger. Because that's what Morgan Stanley breakaway Jason Fertitta and his team did in April of 2019. They opted to leave behind two-thirds of their $6 billion book when they built independent firm Americana Partners in Houston, Texas. It was one of the biggest breakaway stories of the year, and certainly one that demonstrates an extraordinary level of courage and self-belief. Because the leap to independence requires a good deal of fortitude in and of itself. Those who leave chips on the table do so with an exceptional level of confidence in their mission, vision, and values. Jason has a really interesting background prior to starting his career as a financial advisor. He was a salesman in the financial printing industry and, as he shares, became interested in investing when he came into some money by way of a settlement with a former employer. So he joined the Lehman Brothers training program back in 2000, and in 2001, won just one of four spots for what they called non-traditional hires. Then, with the fall of Lehman in 2008, he moved to Morgan Stanley. In less than 20 years, Jason went from print sales to Lehman Trainee, and on to building a $6 billion business. Today, just over a year since they left Morgan, Americana is managing $3 billion in assets. And again, let's unpack that. From $6 billion, choosing to leave two-thirds of the business behind, moved with $2 billion, and now back to $3 billion in assets. And Jason couldn't be prouder. He shares how the weight of asset hurdles are no longer bearing on them, and they can fully focus on delivering more of what their high net worth clients really want. So what was it that drove Jason and his team to make this change? How can they justify leaving a good portion of their assets on the table? What other options did this top team consider? Why did they choose to build the firm with Dynasty instead of going it alone? And ultimately, What made the leap worth it? We talk about all that and more in this episode, recorded from opposite ends of the country and in very different settings. With Jason so graciously sharing his time while vacationing in Aspen with his family, and me and my production team on the East Coast recording in the midst of a tropical storm. Let's jump right into it. Jason, I am so grateful for you joining me today. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Happy to do it and listen to your your stuff regularly. So uh, happy to do it. I'm grateful. You know, I'll share something with you before we begin. Your breakaway story, 
the story when you left Morgan Stanley to form Americana, your RIA, which is what we're going to talk about today, was a really big deal. Not just because every time a breakaway advisor leaves, it's a big deal, but really because yours was the biggest breakaway deal with $6 billion in assets is what you were managing when you left Morgan Stanley. And it was a really big deal. So I'm especially excited to have you share the story today. But let's start at the top, if you would. Tell us a little bit about your background. Yeah, I am what was described back in 2000 when I started in the business as a non-traditional hire. So I started in a class of 40 people at Lehman Brothers in New York, and I think 36 were MBAs from Ivy League schools, and then they reserved four spots for what they considered non-traditional hires. And I had always had a background in sales. And I had a fascination with the market, but I was selling other things, primarily printing, financial printing. And I um, unfortunately had to get into a lawsuit with my employer over commissions. And I won a nice settlement when I was 28 years old. Um, And once I won the settlement and had some money to invest, the light bulb went off and I knew this is what I wanted to do. And Lehman was gracious enough to give me one of those four spots in their training program back in 2001. And so that's how I started in the business was through Lehman's training program. Well, as our listeners will hear, what an extraordinary move that was that in just 19 years, you went from zero to, or 18 years, you went from zero to six billion. But I know you left Morgan Stanley in 2019, where you were consistently top of their ranks. Tell us a little bit about your business, what the business looked like at the time, how much you were managing, and what kind of uh, clients you were serving. Yeah, um, just by virtue of our geography, a lot of our clients were from the energy industry. So a lot of energy entrepreneurs or family offices that were developed because their father or grandfather was an energy entrepreneur. And at the time that we left Morgan Stanley, it was right at $6 billion in assets. And I kind of characterized that into three buckets. Uh, Bucket A was large single stock positions. Bucket B was brokerage business, just your five and 10 cent a share type of business, which is no longer really an industry. And then bucket C, which was kind of our prized possession, was the actively managed bucket. And that was also two billion. So that's kind of how our book broke down at Morgan Stanley. Okay. And we'll get to what it looks like today. But first and foremost, you've named your RIA Americana Partner. So it's always fun for me to ask, where did the name Americana come from? When we were trying to select a name, we hired an ad agency in New York called Leibowitz. And um, they searched coast to coast what was available. And we kind of had our idea of what sounded good. We wanted to definitely name the firm something that didn't pigeonhole it to Texas because we definitely have aspirations and we're working on plans even now to export this platform or RIA to other states. So in terms of Lone Star Capital or Alamo Capital, all those were were off the table. So we had names like Wellington because our CFO is Rob Wellington. We thought that was, you know, a nice name that could be transportable, but there's just so many Wellingtons out there. And and Leibowitz came up with the name Americana. And when they presented it to us on our conference call, we kind of all looked at each other and said, how is that name available? You just add an A to American and it's that's available. And they said it's available. And it's like we when we heard the name, we all knew at once that, you know, we have to get this name. This is too good of a name. You knew it felt right. Okay, good. So let's look at what the business looks like today. What is the firm's value proposition? What I know you've morphed the business today in terms of those three buckets of clients that you've served changed. So what does it look like today and how many partners and staff and all of that? Yeah. So today the business, you kind of have pre-COVID, during COVID and after COVID. But right before COVID, we had hit $3 billion in AUM. We are right back to that point today. Obviously, we took a dip like everyone did from March 24th through actually the end of March is when the bottom hit. So we definitely took a hit. I I would say we got as low as about 2.2 or 2.3. But today the business is uh, 
right at three billion in assets. It is an open architecture platform. So we are uh, 100% using building blocks from external firms to construct our portfolios. And that is the way we approach the business at Morgan Stanley and Lehman as well. But, um, you know, it's, it's just today we're in an environment where we're not trying to be convinced by management to construct it otherwise. And I didn't have an appreciation for how much our clients wanted us to go independent. When you're sitting inside of a big bank, the easy thing to believe is that the big bank's brand logo is adding value to your business because that's just part of the culture of whatever big bank you might be working at. But in reality, when we left and our eyes were open to how much the clients appreciate the independence and the move to go independent and the, the turning down of money from other banks to go from one bank to the other. And so we're actually doing more impactful business and our clients are being more transparent with us in terms of their balance sheets and their goals than the entire time we were at either Lehman or Morgan Stanley. So a couple of questions about that. One, you got smaller to get bigger because let's just clarify, you were at $6 billion when you left Morgan Stanley and you're celebrating being back to $3 billion today. So tell us about that. Yeah. Well, Wall Street firms put these crazy things out there, these, these hurdles when they recruit you, right? So they say, you know, if you can get to six billion in AUM, we'll pay you all this money, right? Well, well, the easiest thing to do if you're a producer that has a good Rolodex is call one of your contacts or friends who has a gigantic single stock position that has no intention of ever selling it or doing anything with it and asking them to deposit it with you, right? In most cases, those families have demands on the firm that is the custodian for those assets in terms of their inability to rehypothecate those shares. But as the advisor, you don't care about that, right? You're just trying to figure your asset hurdle. So our first bucket, which was a single stock, was purely there to trigger asset hurdles for our team to get the ridiculous money that Wall Street was offering us to build our book. Again, that has nothing to do with the RIA space. And so those assets went back to uh, to um, really the transfer agent after we left Morgan Stanley. That you know They're not sitting at Morgan Stanley anymore. The families would have been happy to put them with us at Schwab, but it just, again, it doesn't do anything in the RIA space. The brokerage business, after we left Morgan Stanley April 26, I think three months later, Schwab went to no fees, no commissions on brokerage business. So none of the clients that we work with pay any transactional fees for research and trading like they did you know, in the old days. We always felt like that business was a melting ice cube and that we needed to focus on different types of business, even while we were at Morgan Stanley. And you know, sure enough, that event occurred after we left, shortly after we left, and Fidelity followed suit and so forth and so on. But we never wanted to hang our hat on that $2 billion because we knew that it was a dinosaur was going away. So what we did was we went to our clients that did transactional business and said, why don't you let us put an advisory fee on your brokerage account? That way we're fiduciary, you know, it's under our umbrella. We're required to focus on it. It's not a self-directed account. And we'll match the historical brokerage business you used to do on those assets to a, a low advisory fee. And most of our clients were fine with that and they actually appreciated it. And so we have a substantial amount of that bucket. It's just now in an advisory fee versus a brokerage fee. And then the last bucket, the $2 billion in manage, well, most of that came. There's only, I think, two clients that we really wanted to come that didn't. And so uh, we're very pleased with, with the way our book, and we are celebrating the fact that it's $3 billion because it's the right kind of $3 billion. Yeah. So let me ask you a question relative to that. And by the way, that makes perfect sense to me because a lot of advisors we talk to you know, get sucked in, if you will, to the notion that I am an advisor that manages a billion, or I produce seven million, eight million, three million in production. It's a number that, if you're an employee of a big firm, gets celebrated. Not only celebrated, but it's how you get paid maximally. And what you're talking about is really moving and getting smaller to get bigger and celebrating being smaller because, as you just said, it's the right three billion. And what you'll do is grow now from there. 
Exactly. And like I said, we could have had $8 billion if I'd have asked for it, right? I just yeah. asked for enough single stock to trigger our, our, our asset bonuses at, that Wall Street offered us. Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, those were not doing us any good other than what you're describing. But the, the other thing that it does, which is a negative, is our book of businesses revenue was always very low from a Wall Street perspective because of the single stock. And I kind of celebrated that because I felt like, well, we're giving our clients, you know, competitive pricing. You see teams with, in some cases, a billion dollars in AUM that were doing more in revenue than we were with six billion. Yeah. And I would feel very bad about being in that group of people because you're really just feeding your clients to death. Mm -hmm. I always felt like, you know, having a lot of assets, the competitive fees for the clients was a better spot to be in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you said something, you said, I had no idea how much our clients wanted us to go independent, that they appreciate your independence. But did, do you feel like the clients wanted that or were looking for that before you left or you were referencing how they appreciate your independence since you left? Uh, I think it's a little bit of both. I don't think the clients want to give you the, the answers to the test, if you will. Um, they want you to come to the conclusion yourself. But I would say the segment of clients that really appreciated it were the entrepreneurs, because mm -hmm. in most cases, these entrepreneurs left big companies to start their own business, and that's how they created their family as well. Um, so, so I think they admire the entrepreneurial gene, and they're happy that you're, you're focused on satisfying them. Yeah, that makes sense for sure. And one more thing about Americana, just for perspective. So how many partners are there in the firm? How many supports do you have? How many people in total? Yeah, we have five partners in the firm that, that all left Morgan Stanley to start it. Those partners are myself, Rob Wellington, Josh Kaltreiter, Billy Bush, and Sheldon Bush. And they're all located in different cities. Um, the Bush uh Duo is in Austin, Josh Kaltreiter in Dallas, myself and Rob Wellington in Houston. And we were all partners together at Morgan Stanley. So um, we are at 22 employees right now. We just hired our 22nd employee who will start after Labor Day, which we're very excited about. And that kind of feels about right for the time being. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're, you know, we're always talking to more people about joining our platform. So um, it could change in a nanosecond. Got it. So two big questions everyone wants to know. I want to get to what else you looked at, because even though you're telling me that your revenue was relatively low compared to a $6 billion in asset book, still, there's no question that the kind of deals you would have been offered by competing firms would have been, you know, eye-popping, eye-popping money. Yeah. So yeah. I want to get to that. But the first question I want to ask you is, what were some of the catalysts that led you to leave Morgan and the pulls toward independence? Yeah. Well, I think it's not really just a Morgan Stanley thing. I think every firm is attempting to convert the advisor's clients into their clients legally through uh, enhanced employment agreements. Um, and, and so, you know, I don't mean to uh, throw stones at Morgan Stanley because I, I love so many people there and had such a great career there and great memories of being there. But Morgan Stanley isn't any different than any other firm that is trying to get their advisors to sign new employment agreements, which in effect, the analogy that you hear so much are, you know, puts handcuffs on the advisor. And I think if you're at the very tail end of your career, it's, you know, why not accept a new employment agreement? You, uh, you're close to sunset in any way in terms of, of your career. But in our case, you know, we are an incredibly young team. Myself and Billy Bush are the elder people on the team. And, you know, at the time, this new employment agreement was put in front of me. I was 47. So I just thought that that was a great time to take a deep breath and say, are we going to end our careers within Morgan Stanley or at a Wall Street firm? Or are we going to do what we've always wanted to do, which is create our own firm? So that was really the catalyst for us to really consider it. In terms of the eye-popping money that other firms offer, it is. I mean, we probably could have gotten a $35 million check to leave, and that is a huge number. 
And the problem with that is you're going to hop on a merry-go-round that's going to end in the same place in 10 years or seven years or however long the deal was you signed. And you're going to be faced with the same decision. It's just going to be, you're going to be seven to 10 years older. So we felt like the time was right for us to do this. It was a scary time. There have been nights I've woken up in the middle of the night feeling foolish for turning down, you know, what would have been 35 million to do what most everyone else does. But, but then it, it all kind of came back to what would the client want? And it was my belief that all of the bank platforms are getting more and more commoditized and similar. And what we felt like the client want, wanted was an open architecture platform that removes all conflicts of interest and uh, acts as a fiduciary to their client legally. So we turned down the big box to do what we felt like clients wanted us to do. And that has indeed played out. But did the clients know that that's what they wanted? In other words, I think what I hear you saying is that now that you've given them access to this open architecture platform with no limitations, you are a fiduciary, you're able to sit, shop the street and create pricing service competition for them. You're able to serve them with less limitations and freedom. They appreciate it. But do you think that they knew what they were missing while they were clients of Morgan Stanley or any other brokerage firm? I think some clients knew what they were missing, but they had a good relationship with us and the relationship kind of won out. And, and so they were doing business with us with Morgan Stanley because they, they liked us and they knew we cared and we were empathetic. And, and they knew that despite the conflicts of interest, we were doing what was in their best interest by uh, unearthing the best building blocks we could that were on the pre you know, prescribed menu that we had to, to, to offer them. Um, so I think, I think it was almost like we were doing it in spite of Morgan Stanley for some clients. Other clients definitely wanted it and had some experience in working with RIAs and they, they felt like we would be able to be more productive in that environment. But it's difficult for someone to tell an advisor to turn down $35 million and eviscerate all of their deferred comp to, uh, to, to go on their own. Because, you know, in the short term, you can make the case that it's the worst financial decision you can make for your own family. <laughs> While it's a great decision for your clients, um, it's a very difficult decision to make. But, but again, my whole career, we have always operated with the following mantra, which is if you do what's right by the client, the chips will fall in the right places in the long term. Yeah. And that's the way we've always operated. We've never even looked at what you know, these Wall Street products paid the advisor. There are a lot of advisors and just the nature of uh, the industry and the conflicts of interest, right? There's a lot of advisors that look at what products will pay them, pick the products that pay them well, and they'll sell them to their clients, right? We are the exact opposite. We would obviously try and find what the best products were for the clients. We had no idea what we would get paid. We wouldn't even focus on it. And then, and then the chips fell where the chips would fall. And so we kind of felt like this was just an extension of that. Yeah. So I guess a couple of things about that. I think for most wirehouse advisors, while they have a sense that there might be certain products, certain private investments or certain alternative investments or managers that they can't access, they have a sense that it's open architecture enough. And they believe with all of themselves that they are serving their clients to the best of their ability. They're not harming their clients in any way. So what were the pulls toward independence that made you willing to say, I'm going to give up $35 million, the ability to really take some very significant chips off the table at 45 or 47 years old and I can always go independent 10 years from now. So what was it that brought you to it now? I think it was kind of a confluence of events. It was the fact that if I would have signed that new employment agreement, there would have been no turning back, or at least turning back would be much more challenging. I think it also is just where the industry is. It's The industry is in the midst of a big sea change right now, in my opinion. And so the technology is such, the custodians that are available to you as an RIA are, in my view, safer credits from you know a custodian standpoint than the big banks. And there's ways to affiliate with firms like Dynasty that give you the middle and back office that you know weren't there 10 years ago. Uh, so I think it was kind of a confluence of events. 
And I think it's also, I never wanted to put ourselves in a position where the bank could um, meaningfully tell you what to sell and what to charge your clients. Mm -hmm. And the further you shift over into those handcuffs, uh, the harder that is going to going to be uh, to to execute your business that way inside of a Wall Street bank. I mean, I think the Wall Street banks want to convert the advisor's clients into their clients, not yours. Yeah. And, and, and we wanted to avoid that scenario. Yeah. So you hit on something that we hear a lot or that we talk about it a lot is that the big firms, I mean, firms like Merrill Lynch stopped recruiting altogether. And while Morgan and UBS, for example, and Wells are very actively recruiting, they're recruiting more selectively. But one of the things that they're working hard to do is to tie up as many advisors as they possibly can. And the best way to do that is is via these retire in place or sunset programs. And the more advisors that sign on to them, the more the balance of power shifts from advisor to firm. And the single biggest thing that advisors complain about is a lack or loss of control. And whether that be, to your point, control over the products and services we're allowed to sell or how we're compensated or how much bureaucracy we have to deal with or the solutions we're able to access, whatever it may be, the more control you lose, the less value and optionality you have. So loss of control is probably, or fear of loss of control or worry of continued loss of control is probably one of the biggest drivers toward independence. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. It was our catalyst and it was our catalyst to really seriously contemplate it and then investigate it and ultimately make the change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now you mentioned that I want to talk about some of the pulls toward independence. So the catalyst that the frustrations or the limitations we've talked about, but you also mentioned the desire you're looking to build a national firm, one that's not just rooted in Texas. So what were some of the other pulls toward independence besides from, you know, wanting to add in organic growth to the mix? Yeah. Well, you know, we're sitting in the third largest state in the country from a GDP perspective. And I started to put in the paper on how many firms spawned from the state of Texas and then been exported out regionally and then ultimately nationally that are open architecture. And I couldn't come up with one name to write down on a piece of paper. And hmm. it, I was just miffed by that. We're sitting here. And the families in this particular part of the country, for the most part, all have their money managed by big institutions, you know, on the East and West Coast or international. And I felt those families would really appreciate a conflict-free open architecture firm that spawns from this state and started here. And, and so, uh, so far, we have um, we've really attempted to be that answer for these families. And we're getting a very, very good reception, kind of 60. I mean, it's, it's amazing. It's only been a year and a month a year and a few months, but I mean, we're still brand new, but we're getting very well received so far. That's awesome. Wonderful. Let me ask you a question. Another question. You mentioned to me earlier outside of this recording that fellow ex Lehman alum, Jack Peterson, who formed the RIA Summit Trail, had reached out early on and suggested that you merge your business with his. What would the benefits have been of that? And then ultimately, I guess, what made you decide to form your own RIA instead? Because a lot of advisors grapple with that. Is it easier to associate with something that's already built so I don't have to go through the brain damage of building something from scratch? Well, the brain damage is substantial. Uh, I don't mean to minimize it at all. And I did seriously contemplate that just because I, I felt so highly of Jack Peterson. Jack was ultimately the, the, the boss I resigned to while I was at Lehman. Uh, and that was a very difficult thing to do because I felt and continued to feel so strongly about Jack Peterson and, and how good of an advisor and, and an operator he is in the RIA space today. So when I had that conversation with Jack, the first thing he said to me, which I'll never forget, he said, Jason, if you're contemplating doing this on your own, I'm not going to talk you out of it because that's what I did. And that's a great thing to do. But if you're, if you don't want to go through the brain damage and do it on your own and you do want to join forces with us, 
you know, we would love to, to have a conversation with you about that. Because if you think about Summit Trail, I think they have offices in New York, Chicago, San Francisco, but they don't have a huge representation in the South. And I think our business would have been a nice compliment to their business. But at the end of the day, we really wanted to try and do this on our own as the five founding partners and what we felt like would be our, our clients in the early days. Uh, so we decided to go down that path. But if we were going to go down a different path, Summit Trail was a great platform with people that we were familiar with from our, our Lehman DNA and people that we think very highly of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when you made the decision to build it on your own, you could have either built it on your own and pulled together all the vendors and whatever you needed to support and scaffold the business. Ultimately, though, you chose to associate with Dynasty Financial Partners. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, absolutely. Well, we did a, I would say, a, a fairly in-depth survey of all the potential firms out there that you could affiliate with. We talked to several of them. We chose Dynasty really because we felt like the leadership within Dynasty understood our business better than anyone else we talked to. I think, you know, Cheryl Penny and Todd Thompson, just given their, their years of service at City Smith Barney, that they really understood every facet of our business. We didn't have to explain it to them. They knew why it was configured the way it was configured. They, they were able to kind of dissect our, our business within half an hour in the first meeting. And they certainly weren't the least expensive option of the affiliates out there. But we felt like if you're going to do this, you have one shot to get that first statement that's going to arrive in your client's email inbox or physical mailbox right. You got one shot at it. You don't want to mess that up because you saved some money in terms of who you affiliated with. You want, you want the Rolls Royce of the affiliation space. And we felt like that was Dynasty. And so we, we signed a, uh, a fairly long-term agreement with them that we've been extremely pleased with. Which is wonderful. What do you think are the most impactful things they've done for you? I mean, look, it's easy to say before you break, we don't know what we don't know. So that's right. sort of obvious. But now that you're a year in, it raises the question, are they adding as much value as they did at the beginning? And what are the most impactful things they've done for you? Yeah. Well, clearly you hit the nail on the head. I mean, this would be such a, a heavy lift if you didn't affiliate with someone uh, because you do have a day job, right, when you're working. And they're helping you create the foundation of what ultimately will be your IRA. And that is no small task, and, and they definitely delivered in every aspect of that. Uh, since we launched, they have been incredible. That you know, They have worked with 50 firms like ours at various phases of those firms' evolutions. And so they're incredibly good about pointing out the potholes that an early operator may not see as well as Dynasty, because Dynasty see, has seen this happen 50 times, right? So they're almost a little bit of a business coach in terms of post-launch. They also have a capital markets team that we've leveraged in terms of looking at adding other advisors mm -hmm. and lifting them out of warehouses or maybe buying another RIA or buying other ancillary businesses that you can use as a resource. And, and we've had success interacting with that group. They have been one of the things that was instrumental in the setup is just the ne negotiation of all the vendors. I mean, you don't know at a bank because it's all taken care of for you, you know, what a, what a good deal, a bad deal, or a fair deal is when you're using all of the lawyers to set this up, all the custodians, the reporting, the software that's required. And they kind of have a playbook and, and help negotiate kind of best in class pricing given their their uh, their assets that they represent across the 50 firm. And then the other thing they do, and I think this existed, you know, I will give Wall Street credit where credit's due. I think this definitely existed within Morgan Stanley, is there was a real sense of camaraderie amongst the PWM advisors within Morgan Stanley. So advisors from different regions didn't mind sharing you know, what was working for them or what wasn't working for them because, you know, an advisor in Chicago is not really competing with an advisor in Houston. And I was, I felt like I was going to miss that by going independent, but it, it's been the exact opposite. That environment exists within the dynasty network to where uh, these 50 firms, you know, I think we all appreciate the fact that we've gone independent 
and the owners of these firms don't mind sharing notes and, and trying to help each other, frankly. And I've actually found that even outside of the Dynasty Network, I've talked to business owners that don't use Dynasty that have been very helpful in, in offering me advice and pointing out those potholes, which has been very refreshing. pivot a second back to the wirehouse world you left. And this is not to a pick on the wirehouse world and certainly not to indict Morgan Stanley. I'm sort of thinking about it more in general, but a lot of advisors who are would be breakaways, you know, look, everyone who wouldn't want more freedom and control, which are the hallmarks of being independent. But there are a lot of things that are worrisome about it, at least as far as people that are not there yet. So one of the concerns is leaving behind a big brand name. Do you think that your clients or prospects, is there anyone that had a problem with who is Americana Partners versus a Morgan Stanley or a Merrill Lynch or a UBS? No, I mean, I think there's just as many prospects out there and clients that appreciate the independence as there are that might appreciate the security, if you will, of being with a big firm, a brand name, because really you can poke holes in that and you can get a, a prospect comfortable with the fact that all your money is sitting at Schwab, right? All your money is sitting at Fidelity. It, whoever your custodian is at an RIA, I think explaining to that prospect the security of their assets in kind of the first few minutes of, of that presentation gets them over, you know, the, uh, the the perceived risk of having your money at a boutique small firm that perhaps doesn't have the same brand awareness that a J.P. Morgan does or a Morgan Stanley does. You know, it's all about where the money's sitting and the safety of, of those dollars. And, and, you know, I can make a case that it's safer sitting at Schwab than any of the banks. Yeah. And how about the ability to recreate or best the platform and technology? that you had yeah. as a wirehouse employee? Interestingly enough, we were using Adapar at Morgan Stanley and Morgan mm -hmm. Stanley was charging us for it. So we were paying a heavy tax to use it. And so when we went independent, it was part of our offering through Dynasty. And also interestingly enough, because of the size of the compliance department at Morgan Stanley, the version of Adapar we were using had all these governors on it. So we actually have better software for less money in the independent space than we had it within Wall Street. And mm -hmm. our clients have really appreciated that expanded uh, capabilities that our software has. Yeah. And what about the kinds of things you're able to do now that you are not under a brokerage firm umbrella, or at least that you plan to do? Well, what we, we, we really haven't changed what we do, given that we've left Wall Street to, to go independent. What we've always done is seek out the best building blocks to construct the portfolios that we could find for our clients and leverage the asset allocation advice that in the case of Morgan Stanley and Lehman, you know, they provided for us for those clients. As you know, we hired Morgan Stanley's former CIO, David Dars, who chaired their asset allocation mm -hmm. committee as our CIO. And so you know, we have that same intellectual capital we had at Wall Street in terms of uh, asset allocation advice and making forward-looking projections on every asset class under the sun in terms of what's undervalued, fairly valued, overvalued. And that really dictates the biases that we have when we create these portfolios. Frankly, the pickup is within Wall Street, our building blocks were all selected off a pre-provided menu that Morgan Stanley gave us. And in some cases, the items on that menu were added at our recommendation to Morgan Stanley. And that was not a heavy lift. I mean, we would have to pound the table that Morgan Stanley should add this product because we knew about this product from our Lehman days. And we'd have to go through all the bureaucracy and red tape to get it added to the menu that we could sell. Well, when you're doing a whole lot of that, you can do that in the, in the, in the independent space without any of the red tape and bureaucracy you know, the bureaucrats and the politics. And so we felt like we could just function as a team and do our business in the same way in the independent space that we were doing within a Wall Street firm. So I guess the firm was adding less value to 
the way we ran our business than perhaps to some other advisors. Yeah. Let me ask you another question. A couple of weeks ago, I spoke with a young advisor, probably about 38 years old. He's one of the youngest advisors in his complex at a major brokerage firm. He's a rock star. And as such, he's had a number of soon-to-retire advisors approach him about being becoming his or their next-gen successor. Do you think that's a smart way for this young advisor to build a business? And to give you perspective, he's a rock star. I mean, at 38 years old, he's probably managing about $700 million. He's already been the next-gen inheritor for one or two bucks. So that's how he's gotten to $700 million, at least the last part of uh, the $700 million. And now he's got the opportunity to sign on to three or four, maybe five or six others. Yeah. I think that is a way to build your business. I would not say it's the best way to build your business. I think it's a very tempting way to build your business. And that's, you know, low-hanging fruit if I'm that 38-year-old advisor. And I can't blame him for, for, for leveraging that, right? I would suspect that the strings that the senior advisors are signing, or the, the strings that are attached to the agreements that that senior advisor is signing, and in effect, the junior advisor is inheriting, is going to put that advisor in a, in a spot where he is going to be handcuffed to that institution by virtue of the way he's building out his business. And I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just saying that's that's what the big firms are attempting to do. But it is low-hanging fruit, and it's W-2 income will go through the roof if he successfully executes that plan. So it isn't a bad business model, and it's a very tempting business model. But I don't think it's the best business model. Yeah. Well, I think it's what you're saying is go in with your eyes wide open. It's a good yeah, business exactly. model as long as you know that you can live with whatever changes come down the pike that are out of your control for the life of that agreement or agreements that you sign, that you're confident that your firm and the status quo serves your, your business and your clients best. And as long as you're comfortable with that, it's a very good way to build the business. Yeah, I, I think that the, the litmus test for all of the Wall Street advisors is anytime the bank puts a new agreement in front of you that, that is, is going to move that balance of power to the bank a little bit further, I think you have to say, if I showed this agreement to my clients, would they want me to sign it or not? And if the answer to that is no, then you're not doing the right thing by your client. Mm. And I knew the answer to that was no in my case. I knew 100% of my clients would not want me to sign the new employment agreement. And so it was time to do something. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's a good litmus test. Smart. Let's talk about the future. I'd love to hear, I mean, you're only a year in and it sounds like you're just getting started and you mentioned, you know, you have your sights set on building a national firm, but what other vision or goals do you have for the business? And then ultimately, what do you imagine the end game for Americana will be? Well, I mean, we definitely want to partner with the right teams and the right geographies that have the right, you know, put your client first DNA. And so we're not really focused on the geography as much as we are, you know, partnering with the right advisors. And by all means, I think the big difference between what we want to build and what we, we have started building and what's available out there is a lot of the firms especially on Wall Street, are run by people that have not sat in the seat of the advisor. Morgan Stanley, it's not any different than any other firm, but you know, if you look at the leadership within Morgan Stanley, very few of them have actually done what we do for a living. And so it's super important for us in management at Americana to not lose sight of that. And I still have my, my pads on. I'm out there with our advisors creating opportunities sourcing clients to them, working with them to secure business. And, and I think we have great relationship. I have a great relationship with all of our advisors because they know that that's what I've done for 20 years, right? I mean, you don't always get told yes in this business, right? There's a lot of babies and no's and well, what if, what if we did it this way? And so being able to go back to your management team who has actually sat in your seat and done what you're doing, I think is a differentiator. So we never want to lose sight of that. We want to create a firm with great culture that compensates and rewards all of our clients more handsomely than Wall Street. 
And so I think we have a, a structure that enables everyone at our firm to participate in the success of our firm. And I think that excites people. And it's very tempting to develop some proprietary product because we do have a lot of money invested in our investment committee and the people on it. But we always go back to we never want to sell our own product because we feel like if you're truly 100% open architecture, that's a differentiator because so many of these RIAs go down a different path, which you know I get and I understand, but they want to use their intellectual capital that they're able to incubate internally to then offer a product to their clients because you know they can generally offer it at a lower price and higher margins. I get that, but it's a slippery slope, and, and we definitely want to avoid going down that slope. Mm-hmm. And how about, I mean, again, only a year in, but what do you imagine the end game is? What does it look like? Yeah. Well, I mean, I've actually brought in quite a few external people of Americana to speak to our clients on culture and the building of a, of a good business. And one of my favorite people that I brought in was Johnny Caraba, who built the Italian restaurant chain mm-hmm. Carabas and sold it to Outback. And he's a very good friend of mine and we're business partners in some, some things together, the two of us. Interestingly enough, our families go back to the same town in Sicily called Chefalou. And last summer, um, I, I took my whole family there on a trip uh, that this one town is half Bertitas, half Carabas. And so that was, that was fun. But one of the things he said in one of his conversations with all of our employees was, if you're building a business to sell it, you're, you're already messing up right out of the gate. He said, focus on your craft, focus on what you do, and people will notice and let it evolve naturally. And, and, and so that's what we've been doing. We've been making sure that our clients are, are well taken care of. We over communicate with them. We have not lost one client since we started Americana. And like I said, there's only two or three that we wish would have come from Morgan Stanley that didn't. Um, so, so I think we're doing a very good job focusing on our craft. And in terms of what the end game will be, if we're really good at our craft and we grow the business and we attract those advisors that are like-minded with the same kind of DNA, uh, it could be something that we could take public. It could be something that some other bank would see our geographic footprint. Uh, and appreciate the um, the independence, and so they could buy us as a subsidiary. I could see any of those two things happening someday, or it could be something that we just distribute out the uh, you know the, the the cash flow to to our our investors. Uh, yeah. It could be any of those three. Um, so I'm not trying to force it into to any of those scenarios, but I'm just I'm open to them all. Yeah. Well, that's what's exciting about being a business owner is you get to control that destiny. Right. We record this in the midst of the COVID crisis. It's actually been by my count almost month five. It feels like month 55, but um, still many of us are working from home. So just wondering how you're managing these days. I mean, the firm is only a year old. So how challenging has this crisis been for your young firm? Yeah. You know, I would say when it started, you know, we did when the first few cases, you know, were in China, and I mean, we never saw this thing getting as big as it got. I mean, we kind of felt like, you know, there's been viruses and pandemics before. We just didn't see a scenario to where the economy would get shut down in the way that it has. So it, it, it's definitely been eye opening for us. And, you know, like most companies, we've done all the things that we felt like we needed to do to make our work environment for our employees, which are, um, you know, the highest priority for us, safe. So we, I mean, we take temperature, we log it when every employee walks in the door. We've just added thousands of dollars worth of dividers on our trading floor. And fortunately, just by alert, virtue of luck, you know, they were spaced out, you know, right at six feet or more when we built out our trading floor. But we've added a lot of enhanced safety. We have not gotten back to full run rate in terms of employees in our office today, and I don't know when we will. So we invested a lot in technology, which is enabling employees to work from home. But I would say when we kind of came back to working in our offices, 
we did it as one third in the beginning, two thirds today, and that last third is just a TBD. Um, so, so that in terms of just the the health and safety of our employees, that's kind of what we've been doing. Um, in terms of how to allocate client assets, it made us think incredibly differently. Fortunately, I would say we're pretty conservative investors by nature. And because so many of our clients created their wealth in the energy industry, we've always attempted to avoid energy as much as we can, which I think has been disproportionately hit because of COVID. So that's certainly helped our performance in regards to our equity portfolios. But we also tend to allocate capital to money managers that are incredibly judicious on the stocks they pick in regards to the amount of debt on those companies' balance sheets. So you've seen a lot of firms. I know Goldman came out with kind of this COVID list of equities, which are really just firms that have great balance sheets and not a lot of net debt. And when we looked at that list that came out from Goldman, we kind of looked at it and said, well, this is what our clients own all the time anyway. So there's really not a, not a whole lot of shifts we made in, in the types of managers we use, but we definitely um, are focused on it. We are watching the, I mean, we're sitting in Houston with the biggest medical center in the country and the CEO of that medical center, I get a daily update from on cases. So we're watching this thing incredibly closely, but you know, like everyone, you know, no one knows what the future is going to hold with this thing. They just know that we're going to have to live with it for a while. Yeah. And do you think that it would have been easier to have been an employee of Morgan Stanley or any brokerage firm than being a business owner? In other words, if you sort of had an etch a sketch and could do it again, where would you prefer to be writing this pandemic out? I think it'd be harder because I think if you look at the way Morgan Stanley had us physically configured, which I don't think is any real different than any big bank. I mean, we were like sardines on a trading desk, just packed in tight. And to my knowledge, even in Houston, the Morgan Stanley advisors have not come back to the office. So I think by virtue of the way our physical configuration was, we never shut our office down. We were able to continue to work throughout this whole thing in our space. And I think the, you know, for the people that say, oh, I'm so efficient working from home, this is just as good. I just don't buy that. I think communication and being able to pop your head out of an office or around the corner of a trading floor and asking a quick question you know, sometimes while you're on the phone with a client, you can't replicate that communication by working from home. It's just just no way. So I've been very clear, maybe too clear, in some of my communications to Americana that there are a lot of companies out there that are talking about downsizing office space and and, and talking about certain types of employees permanently working from home. Well, I mean, that is not Americana. We're going to go into the office we're going to communicate freely on behalf of our clients to help them in the most effective way we can on their portfolios. And from where do you get the input, support, thought leadership, and research you need to weather this storm or any other? Yeah, well, um, a lot of different people. Like I said, we have very deep Rolodexes of various industry leaders. You know, for example, uh, Bill McKeon, who's the CEO of the Texas Medical Center is a very close contact. And, you know, I get daily updates literally from him on just the pandemic and where it sits in regards to our geography, right? Cheryl Penny is another resource. He's talking to people all over the country about how they're running their business. And and then, you know, David Darst, our, our chief investment officer, his Rolodex has been in creation for 45 years and he has access to doctors and scientists all over the world. So we have a Monday morning call that David chairs. And then we have a partner call. Actually, I had our partner call before this podcast. So we're in constant communication with each other and leveraging our Rolodexes to access various experts across the world of medicine and science as often as we can. I think what you'll learn, though, is even the experts in medicine and science, there's a lot they don't know. (laughs) <laughs> right. That's absolutely correct. And what you're saying is not missing a beat. Yeah. I mean, all you can do is get as much information as you can and analyze it and recognize that even the experts don't know everything. But my sense is 
you know, this thing's going to be around and be around for a while and it's changing the way we all live. And, you know, a vaccine's going to be wonderful if we have it. But I don't believe that there's going to be, uh, I mean, you talk to people about, you know, you want to be the first person in line to take that vaccine. There's a lot of people in this country that just kind of want to see how that vaccine works for a while before they get in that line. Yeah. But I think the question is that as an independent, am I going to be on an island and not be able to access the information I need in order to make the best decisions to both run the business and service my clients? And what you're telling me is, is that you haven't missed a beat in terms of that access. No, and I think there's probably a difference, too, in the independent space of just what your Rolodex looks like and who you have access to. I mean, if you just came out of graduate school and says and said, I want to be an RIA, you would probably be trying to operate with a you know somewhat blindfolded compared to what we're doing. I mean, we've got the benefit of David Darst's Rolodex, my Rolodex, you know, other people at our firm's Rolodex, and we're getting real-time great information in regards to this pandemic and numbers and how it's affecting businesses of all types. I mean, there's some businesses, obviously, it's, it's been helping. If you're, if you're considered an essential business by the U.S. government and you're a CVS or you're a Walgreens or you're a Costco, your net operating income's up. Or a Peloton. <laughs> or a Peloton. If yeah. you're in the hospitality industry, you know, my distant relative, it was interesting when we launched, uh, it seemed like most of the media's questions are, were, are you related to Tillman Fertitta? Um, mm. He is in casinos, hotels, and NBA franchises. I mean, you just it's hard to, to have picked industries that have been more affected by this. Yeah, so sure. I know he's he's been in incredibly busy working through the challenges that uh, the pandemic has, has created. And that's definitely another, what I would say, industry expert that, you know, that I've talked to quite a bit uh, about all of this. So, Jason, I've taken up enough of your time. We're bumping up at just about an hour. This has been fascinating and wonderful. One final question. Our listeners fall into a couple of different categories. They are prospective breakaways, meaning people like you who are advisors at the major firms considering independence. They are industry leaders, meaning the people that run the platform firms and service providers and custodians that support the independent space. And they are already independent business owners who want to hear from other successful entrepreneurs. So any final word of wisdom for any and all of them? Yeah. Well, I would just say that, you know, if you're contemplating going this path, just know that, you know, the bank does take care of a lot of things behind the scene that you can, by all means, replicate through partnering and affiliates. They're definitely out there and they're definitely great, qualified partners for an RIA. But you also are going to be tied into some management duties that you just need to go into with your your eyes wide open that, that the bank takes care of for you. But having said all that, we would not have done anything differently. It was very difficult to walk away from the money that, that Wall Street offers for you to go from one firm to the other. But if there's if there's one message that I hope people that listen take away is that litmus test that we all did to ourselves, which is Ask yourself before you sign anything and before you make a decision, what would your client want you to do? And that's generally going to point you in the right direction for your career. Yeah, it's a great one. And thank you for sharing that for sure. Your firm is only a year old, but I hope that you will agree to join me again in the future and we can hear more about how you continue to execute on your wonderful vision. Thank you so much. I appreciate the time. Have a great day. You too. As Jason put it, the industry is in the midst of a big sea change. As such, there are more options than ever before that allow advisors to serve their clients and grow their businesses. For Jason, he says it's about asking yourself what's best for your clients, and that answer led him and his team down the path they felt was best for everyone's future. I thank you for listening, and I encourage you to visit our website, diamond-consultants.com, and click on the tools and resources link for valuable content. You'll also find a link to subscribe for regular updates to the series. 
And if you're not a recipient of our weekly email, Perspectives for Advisors, click on the blog link to browse recent articles. These written pieces are an ideal way to stay informed about what's going on in the wealth management space without expending the energy that full-on exploration requires. Feel free to email or call me if you have specific questions. I can be reached at 908-879-1002 or by cell 973-476-8578 or by email at mdiamond at diamond-consultants.com. Please note that all requests are handled with complete discretion and confidentiality. And again, if you enjoyed this episode, feel free to share it with a colleague who might benefit from its content. And a special thanks to AdvisorHub.com for sharing this podcast with their viewers and subscribers. This is Mindy Diamond on Independence.